Hello, my name is Fabio and I'm a veterinary cardiologist. With this presentation, I would like to refresh some of the diagnostic and treatment aspects of a relatively common cardiac emergency, which is pericardial effusion. I hope you enjoy and I hope you will find this useful next time you have a patient with this uh, condition. So as you know, normally the pericardial cavity contains around 0.25 mils per kilo so a tiny amount of a clear plasma ultrafiltrate with low number of cells and proteins. Um, instead, pericardial effusion is an abnormal accumulation of pericardial fluid, obviously, uh, exceeding the physiological amount and is associated with changes in the fluid constituent as well. Like, for example, there is a change in color and also an increased number of proteins and cells. On the other side, in case of cardiac tamponade, there is an intrapericardial pressure that rises to the point of exceeding the right heart pressures, which are lower than the left heart pressures. This pressure change is particularly important during diastole, when the right side uh, pressure are closer to zero. And this will compromise um, as you can understand, the right chamber dilation during diastole, so reducing the right ventricular filling, leading to a reduced cardiac output. For this reason, cardiac tamponade is a live threatening condition and needs to be treated as soon as possible. So pericardial effusion begins to exert hemodynamic consequence as soon as the intrapericardial pressure rises above zero. And in the initial stage of the disease, some compensatory mechanisms are activated to avoid an excessive drop of cardiac output, the classic consequence of uh, cardiac tamponade or pericardial effusion. These mechanisms are mainly represented by uh, RAS activation and increased sympathetic tone, leading to increased heart rate, sodium water retention, and venoconstriction attempting to blunt uh, any declining cardiac output, which, as we say, is the classic consequence of this condition. However, with time, this compensatory mechanism can further increase the cardiac feeling pressures and potentially lead to right-side congestive failure. At, the, uh, at least in the uh, initial stage, in the acute phase of the disease, of this condition, a decrease in left ventricular diastolic filling is the main cause of the decreased cardiac output. Indeed, the left ventricular systolic function um, is not the cause of the arterial hypertension, but again, is mainly the decrease in left ventricular diastolic filling. Excess pericardial fluid accumulates with a variety of systemic cardiac and pericardiac disorders. <clears throat> In dogs, the most common type of pericardial effusion is hemorrhagic, and the most frequently identified cause of pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponades in this species is cardiac neoplasia, most commonly hemangiosarcoma or heart-based uh, tumor, such as chemodactoma or ectopic thyroid carcinoma. And other neoplastic causes include lymphoma and mesothelioma. Idiopathic pericardial effusion is the most frequently non-neoplastic disorder causing cardiac tamponade, um, but more commonly compared to the uh, neoplasia, this is seen in younger dogs. Less common non-neoplastic cause of pericardial effusion in dogs are cardiomyopathies, atrial wall tear, traumatic, infectious and uremic pericarditis. <clears throat> In CAT, instead, pericardial effusion are frequently associated with advanced cardiomyopathy. And then we have other less frequent causes, such as FIP, for example. In those CATs with pericardial effusion secondary to cardiomyopathy, effusion is unlikely to be severe enough to lead to cardiac tamponade. The presentation of cats and dogs suffering of pericardial effusion can vary based on the rapidity of filling of the pericardial sac, because obviously an acute rapid decreased stroke volume can lead to weakness, collapse, dyspnea, uh, dyspnea tachypnea, 
tachycardia potential and even potentially lead to cardiogenic shock. Patients instead with a more chronic presentation often have a vague history. Uh, they might present for inappetence, lethargy, exercise intolerance, potentially some abdominal distension, tachypnea, dyspnea, and even cough. Muffled heart sounds due to the fluid accumulation within the pericardial sac, a weak pulse due to reduced stroke volume, tachycardia secondary to increased sympathetic tone, and pale mucous membrane uh, due to vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction are the hallmark physical abnormalities of acute cardiac tamponade. All the signs associated with pericardial effusion are signs of right side congestive failure, such as ascites, muffled lung sound, jugular pulsation or distension, positive hepatojugular reflux, hepatomegaly, ascites, cachexia, and pulsus paradoxus. Pulsus paradoxus is an exaggeration of a physiological phenomenon that is due to an increased pressure within the pericardial sac and is defined as a fall of systolic arterial blood pressure of more than 10 mm of mercury during inspiration, inspiratory phase of normal breathing. What it means basically is a change, a variation in femoral pulse um, quality throughout the different phase of the respiratory cycle. So we have a stronger pulse in inspiration and a weaker pulse in inspiration. This sign is not extremely common. I think it's only present around 20-30% of uh, cases of, with this condition, but it gives a good indication towards the diagnosis when it's present. In order to assess the cardiovascular stability of these patients with this condition and to further investigate the cause of pericardial effusion, I would recommend always performing blood work full blood work and assessing blood pressure. We would always also include a coagulation screen to rule out possible coagulopathies such as rodenticide toxicosis as the cause of pericardial effusion. Radiographs and ECG are both insensitive and non-specific for the diagnosis of pericardial effusion. However, those tests can be supportive of the presence of this condition in suspected cases. A common radiographic findings is cardiomegaly in those cases, and this can be assessed by objective measurements such as vertebral heart score, or subjectively by assessing other signs such as dorsal elevation of the trachea or increased sternal contact of the cardiac silhouette. Another characteristic feature of pericardial effusion is the presence of very sharp, neat margins of the cardiac silhouette, assuming what is sometimes called the basketball shape. Also, small lobo pulmonary vessel or evidence of pleural effusion can be noted. A fat caudal vena cava, so a fat distended caudal vena cava, can also be seen when there is an ongoing congestion. However, on the other side, in the acute setting of this condition, the code of vena cava may appear small instead due to cardiogenic shock. Different electrocardiographic abnormalities can be variably present in cases of pericardial effusion, and those include sinus tachycardia, damped QRS voltage, so small amplitude QRS complexes, 
ventricular arrhythmias, and electrical alternance. The latter, the electrical alternance, is an electrocardiographic phenomenon defined as an alternating amplitude O axis of the QRS complexes in any or all leads. So basically, is a bit-to-bit -bit voltage variation of the QRS complexes. However, it is important to remember that the ECG remains an insensitive test, and so a normal ECG trace does not rule out pericardial effusion. As you can imagine, echocardiography remains the most specific test for the diagnosis of pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. The echocardiographic features, or the main echocardiographic feature of pericardial effusion, are the presence of an anechoic, so a black space between the pericardial sac and the epicardium, and the swinging motion of the heart within the pericardial sac itself. If cardiac tamponade is present, you will also notice a collapsing right side of the heart as well. In order to differentiate between pleural effusion and pericardial effusion, there are some tricks that can be useful. Um, like, for example, the distribution of the pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion boundaries are smooth and neat, and they tend to follow the pericardial sac. And also, pericardial sac is not present, is not, cannot be seen behind the atria, so cannot be seen dorsally to the base of the heart. And this is because the pericardial sac uh, layers uh, fuse together with the great vessel at the level of the heart base. So it's not possible to see any pericardial fluid above this region. As you can imagine, echocardiography remains the most specific test for the diagnosis of pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. The echocardiographic features, or the main echocardiographic feature of pericardial effusion, are the presence of an anechoic, so a black, space between the pericardial sac and the epicardium, and the swinging motion of the heart within the pericardial sac itself. If cardiac tamponade is present, you will also notice a collapsing right side of the heart as well. In order to differentiate between pleural effusion and pericardial effusion, there are some tricks that can be useful. Um, like, for example, the distribution of the pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion boundaries are smooth and neat, and they tend to follow the pericardial sac. And also, pericardial sac is not present, is not, cannot be seen behind the atria, so cannot be seen dorsally to the base of the heart. And this is because the pericardial sac uh, layers uh, fuse together with the great vessel at the level of the heart base, so it's not possible to see any pericardial fluid above this region. As we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, differentiation between pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade is extremely important. As you can see on the top left uh, video, we have a right parasternal long axis view where a right atrium is distended throughout the cardiac cycle. Instead, in the bottom right video, uh, with the same right parasternal long axis view, we can see a right atrium that is collapsing during diastole, making diagnosis of cardiac tamponade. So it means that this case uh, needs a more urgent approach. The 2D M mode technique can also be useful to assess the presence of cardiac tamponade. In the picture on the left, you can see clearly the internal diameter of both left and right ventricle made up by this black anechoic space throughout the cardiac cycle whereas in the picture on the right the a collapsing right ventricle can be seen during ventricular diastole so the anechoic black space is intermittently present 
confirming the diagnosis of cardiac tamponade. As a general rule, furosemide is contraindicated in this condition because diuresis will lead to further reduction of preload in an already underload heart, causing further reduction of cardiac output. However, this is not necessarily true in cats, where we said the most common cause of pericardial effusion is the presence of advanced cardiomyopathy and leading to secondary uh, heart failure. In these cases, though, uh, furosemide um, is extremely useful to reduce the preload. Also, in dogs with advanced mitral valve disease and left atrium enlargement, which might suffer of left atrial tear, furosemide can be started to reduce the preload and the left atrial pressure, although the treatment in these cases remains controversial. In patients with cardiac tamponade and hemodynamic compromise, pericardial synthesis and rapid intravenous fluid resuscitation should be performed as soon as possible, with the timing of pericardial synthesis de depending on the degree of cardiovascular compromise. However, it is important to remember that the presence of pericardial effusion can help identify the presence of a cardiac mass. So when possible, pericardial synthesis should be delayed after a full echocardiographic assessment. Pericardial synthesis are performed under light sedation. The, the patient is placed on left lateral recumbency so that you can perform the procedure on the right hemithorax, mainly to avoid the main left coronary arteries. The dog is surgically prepared between the third and the eighth intercostal space. And if available, a ultrasound guidance should be used to assess the best location for needle insertion. If not available, you can always uh, estimate the best place based on the heartbeat that you can feel of the chest on the chest wall. Local anesthesia with lidocaine is also recommended in this case. And very important is to use an ECG while performing this procedure because this will um, enable you to assess for possible malignant arrhythmias that can develop during the, the procedure, but also would allow you to assess for any changes um, throughout the procedure, which might indicate you, it might suggest you that you are in the correct position and draining the correct sample. For example, if you are draining the pericardial effusion, you're expecting a better uh, cardiac feeling, a better cardiac output, and as a consequence, the heart rate will slow down. Also, because of the re re reduction in volume around the, you know, fluid around the heart, the QRS amplitude will also increase. Whereas if you're, for example, draining from the inside, uh, from intracardiac um, fluid, so if you're draining blood, you will see that the tachycardia will persist. There are many techniques and methods uh, to perform that you can use to perform a pericardial synthesis. In CAT, for example, using a butterfly needle is usually enough to allow to you, to, you to do this. Uh, however, in DOG, in my opinion, using a pericardial synthesis kit will make this procedure relatively safe easy and fast to be performed. The kit comprises, as you can see in the picture in the middle, a large um, needle which is used to insert, um, uh, which is inserted in the incision that you made with the blade, the stab incision. And then you have a um, guide wire, which is in the picture is inside the um, plastic um, delivery uh, delivery sheet um, and then obviously you have a syringe and the other syringe is just with lidocaine uh, for the local anesthesia. On the picture on the left you can see the extension tube that is attached to the uh, blue multifenestrate catheter of the pericardial uh, kit and then we have a um, one-way valve which we attach at the end of the extension tube it makes things a bit easier compared with the three-way tap. It's just you don't have to do um, that maneuver every time you are um, aspirating and um, collecting the fluid. 
Also, we have, I put two tubes in the picture on the left, just because obviously every time we perform this procedure, we collect some sample for uh, laboratory analysis. And the rest of the fluid obviously is collected in the jug. This is an illustration to show how we use this pericardial kit. You can see on the fast picture on the left, uh, how my colleague is doing the lidocaine injection, so some uh, local anesthesia. Then she's performing a stab incision on the skin at the level uh, that we decide is the most appropriate uh, sized uh, of injection. And then you use the big needle that we saw before, is 18 gauge, I think, um, and you attach a syringe to the needle and you put some negative pressure on the syringe. So then you advance slowly the needle fast into the skin. Then you um, point the needle towards the shoulder of the other side, so the left shoulder of the dog. And then you continue to advance slowly into the pericardium. Once you're into the pericardium, you should feel like a little scratch. And also because of the negative pressure in the syringe, you should have some fluid in the syringe as well withdrawn into the syringe. At that point, when you have the fluid in the syringe, you remove the syringe and you feed the needle um, with the guide wire. Once the guide wire in it is in, it, in the pericardium, then you remove the needle and you are left with the guide wire inside the pericardium. So at this stage, we are left with the guide wire into the pericardium. You use the guide wire to feed the blue multifenestrate catheter through the guide wire inside the pericardium. At that point, you remove the guide wire and you're left with a catheter inside the pericardium and you're ready to drain. In this picture, you can see that my colleague is draining with a syringe because he's collecting the fast sample just to send it to, um, to the lab. But then we will connect the extension tube instead of the syringe, the one-way valve and then the syringe to make the um, um, the drainage even easier. Just before concluding this presentation, <clears throat> I want to show you some potentially important feature in the prognosis of dogs with uh, pleural refusion and pericardial tantum. Based on the clinical history and clinical science, we can already make an assumption on the prognosis of these cases. For example, we know that pericardial effusion associated with collapses and cardiac mass has usually, have usually a worse prognosis, although again, the prognosis can be very, um, can be variable. On the other side, the presence of ascites doesn't seem to be related uh, to be a negative uh, factor, prognostic factor in these cases. Indeed, it seems actually that the presence of ascites is associated with a better outcome. And most importantly, performing pericardectomy increases the, um, the outcome, even in those cases with the cardiac mass. So it's always worth to discuss this with your client, as the prognosis might not be always as bad. In conclusion, the take home messages from this talk are the echocardiography is essential for diagnosis of pericardial effusion and to differentiate pericardial effusion from cardiac tamponade. This is, as we said, particularly important because cardiac tamponade, as a consequence of pericardial effusion, is a life threatening condition and treatment should be performed immediately. Pericardial synthesis is the most adequate treatment in these cases. Also, presence of collapse or masses, cardiac masses or microcardiography, are negative pronostic indicators. However, even in these cases, treatment of uh, cardiac tamponades could lead to a better outcome. So it's always worth to discuss this with your client. Thank you very much for watching this presentation. I hope you found it useful. Uh, please feel free to email Vetsbook if you have any questions about this topic. And once again, thank you very much for listening.